Welcome. We're going to read scripture. 1 Corinthians 15. Come on up. It says Mark 16, but I changed that, so it's 1 Corinthians 15. Do you know that? Okay. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> Good. Sometimes I change things, and I don't tell people. I'm not preaching on communication today. <laughs> go, go ahead. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, it is in this life only. We are all of people to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Thank you. So you, what you're saying is the resurrection is the big deal? Just a little. Okay, good job. Thank you. I appreciate that. That is true. That is true. So yeah, we are in 1 Corinthians 15, and um, in case you're visiting or looking online, you're wondering who we are, we're, we're a Grace Life Bible Church. We're excited about the grace of God. We, um, our values are knowing God and His Word, experiencing grace and extending grace, growing in healthy relationships, which takes a few decades, and then impacting those near and far, okay? So it's a lifelong process of internalizing grace, uh, becoming really resilient disciples, and moving forward. So our core values of knowing, experiencing, growing, you know, we're, we, we're being disciples and we're making disciples. That's what we're about. But as you think about being a disciple, like when are you done with that? When are you like, check the box, yeah, I did that? And not, not exactly a, a clear threshold of I am already done it. I mean, we are in the process. But here's the deal. Um, one of the milestones of mature discipleship is the ability to reframe suffering as a spiritual discipline. We're going to be kind of talking about that today, and so um, that's, that's where we're going. So how do we do that? Um, why did Jesus go to the cross? Did Jesus go to the cross so we wouldn't have to? No. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus went to the cross to show us how to. It's kind of a, kind of a switch that our culture of comfort doesn't really get. So before we get into this, I'm going to do a responsive reading. We don't do this much, but I'm going to read a line, and then you read a line, and this is all out loud, okay, in case you've never heard of this. We take turns, all right? So here we go. Christ is risen. The world below lies desolate. Christ is risen. The spirits of evil are fallen. Christ is risen. The angels of God are rejoicing. Christ is risen. The kings of the dead are empty. Christ is risen indeed from the dead, the first of the sleepers. Glory and power are his forever and ever. Amen. So... That's good. So today we're taking a look at this. Are you a weekend Christian? It's a trick question, so don't answer out loud. <laughs> Should you be a weekend Christian? Okay, going to move into this and um, ask some questions. Why do we worship on Sunday? This is Sunday. I think I've told you before I was in college, seriously, before I learned that the Sabbath w was not Sunday. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. The, sa the, the Sabbath is the, the last day. The Sabbath rest comes... You, Sunday's the first day of the week, you work, and then you take a Sabbath break at the end of the week, which is Saturday. Saturday's the Sabbath. I know some of you will be like, what? Jesus, why do we worship Sundays? And part, you know, we know it's like, well, because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. The early church switched from gathering on the Sabbath, like an Old Testament mindset, and they started to gather on Sunday, the first, New Hope, and, and Jesus rose, that's cool, but... Um, so Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday, but why was he dead in the first place? I'm going to say it a lot this morning. He didn't go to the cross so we wouldn't have to. He went to the cross to show us how to. 
Okay? So I'm going to build on this, but why did Jesus rise from the dead? That's kind of a broad, big question. I mean, it fulfills prophecy. Uh, he defeated sin, death, and darkness. That's, that's where forgiveness is. And, and as the passage was read, if you can dismantle the resurrection, Christianity falls apart. It absolutely falls apart, all right? And it's interesting that no one has done that yet. They can't, they can't undo the resurrection. You can go into history, and you can, you can look and all this stuff, but um, you just can't undo that, all right? So, um, in fact, I remember I was at UNL in college taking this class, and uh, the teacher, I don't think, was a believer or anything. She was just going through history, whatever history section it was. She covered the, the biblical period. And I'm like, what's she going to do when she gets to the whole? Because, you know, it's a big deal. The whole, the whole church and Jesus and the disciples and the world, world history. She goes through and, well, at this time, um, you know, in, in central Palestine, you have um, Jesus and his disciples. And he's created quite a stir and some conflict and um, then he was, he was killed, and, um, and then he rose from the dead, and I'm and kind of, and like, that's it? I mean, like, like I, I should have, like, is that unusual? <laughs> but I was so stunned in the moment, I'm like, she just treated it like, like, just like, you mow your lawn, and he rose from the dead. So, anyway, if I could go back in time, I would ask that question. Anyway, so why did he rise from the dead? That there's, only, there's over 300 specific prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Jesus suffering and dying and rising. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53 is super common. Uh, collectively, they, they, they say the Messiah will be silent in front of his accusers. He will be killed as a substitute for sinful people. He will die with criminals. He will be buried with the rich. Those are kind of strange things. You don't just make that stuff up. I mean, that's kind of specific. He will not stay dead. That's another thing you're not just going to make up on the fly. The New Testament is, is clear that the resurrection is the beginning of something. But let me ask, how do you think about the resurrection? Is, is the resurrection, is it like the end of a bunch of Old Testament stories and a long train of, of getting the Messiah, getting the people of Israel together, getting them established in the land and, and producing the Messiah, and, and he dies and he's resurrected? And So that's the closure of, of a story of redemption? Or do you look at the resurrection as the beginning of the New Testament story of, of like, well, no, it's the beginning because by his resurrection, you know, the spirit comes and the church is born and, and the whole thing starts. The answer is E, all of the above, right? On those tests, it, 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 it's both, okay? So in the passage that was read, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, um, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And then listen to this. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ rising from the dead is the first of a new whole reality, the first fruits, okay? That's what we celebrate on Easter. The resurrection is the beginning of a whole new thing. Um, so we celebrate Easter. We don't just look back and happy for this and, and reminiscent on that. Uh, we're celebrating the future that it's a new way of living, a new way of living Aware of our sin and shortcoming, aware of our addictions and our habits that are destructive, that we just get stuck in, with the reality that Jesus knows that, and he pursues us in love. The lies of the enemy are like, you're shamed, you're, you're, you're this, you're that, and we need to get truth in our head so we are free to move towards Jesus and receive his forgiveness and let his spirit work in our lives, uh, and that's, that's good. So... That's kind of where we're, where we're going. Um, we are participants in a new ministry of reconciliation. We all have a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling other people to God and maintaining our joy uh, relationship with him. Um, for 2 Corinthians 5, he, Christ reconciled us to himself, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So you have a ministry, in case you didn't know that. Um, but there's a catch. Uh, the world's not redeemed which means it's full of sin and brokenness and evil. And we bump into that sometimes head on. And so, you know, we're studying the book of Job in other Sundays. And the question of what's the role of suffering, how do we think about that? And frankly, our culture just really doesn't do that well. We have a very um, uh, positive, encouraging culture. And so we don't have many classes on here. I suffer well. And so we're going to... Um, we're going to dig into that.
But here's the deal. With, with Easter weekend, we want to be weekend Christians. And here's, here's where I'm going with that. Um, some people are Sunday-only Christians. They deny the suffering of Friday. They just want Sunday. Positive encouraging. Sunday. But they, but they kind of downplay the whole Friday thing. And other people are stuck in the, in the suffering of Friday. They don't even see Sunday, all right? And so there's different, different, um, different errors we can do here. But without Friday's suffering, there's no rejoicing on Sunday, right? And, and, and without Sunday's rejoicing, you're just stuck in perpetual suffering and darkness. So, so we want to be weekend believers that embrace both Friday's suffering and Sunday's victory, right? You see where I'm, see where I'm going with that? So it's, it's a bit tricky, but uh, I, I thought you're the advanced crew, so I can... I can do that. But again, Jesus did not go to the cross so we wouldn't have to. He went to the cross so to show us how to. That's why he says, take up your cross and follow me. He he didn't say, take up my cross and hide in your basement. Right? He said, take up your cross. And in that culture, we had a song that talked about the tree, the whole, the whole, there's shame, shame associated with hanging from a tree and the cross. And, and the aspect of shame in the crucifixion is, is one that is almost unbearable. All right? If, if Jesus died as a hero, if, if he's like, I'll volunteer, and everyone's like, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's just wonderful. And, and that would be one thing, but. The shame, they crucified him in an intersection like I-80 and I-29 where everyone's passing through. They did it in such a way as a public spectacle to, to say, anyone who follows him, this is your end. And so it was, it was extremely shameful um, the way he died. And so he said, take up your cross, join me in shame. Meanwhile, the disciples are thinking of victory over Rome, and so that's, that's a big deal. So... Um, all right, so both suffering of Friday and the victory of Sunday are part of our normal Christian experience. And again, in our culture, it really, it's hard to think biblically about suffering because we have these, these shallow sentiments about suffering. Well, something's wrong with your faith, or you didn't do something right, or God's mad at you. We don't really have space in the way we view God and his word and our the indwelling spirit of, uh, of suffering as, as a spiritual discipline. I mean, if you talk to people about suffering very often, not always, but you're going to get advice. You well, know, do this, do this, do this. You know, here's a book. Well, we need, to, we need to get that over with, right? And instead of just like, I will pray for you as you are in the middle of suffering. It, with, with the idea that this might be right where God wants you for his purposes. Now, if we do crazy things and break the law, then that's, that's on us, all right? God can still work through that, but that's just a different thing, all right? So... All right, Friday plus Sunday. Um, so you might, maybe you grew up in a Christian environment. Maybe you grew up going to Juan in Sunday school, Bible camp, men's stuff, women's stuff, you know, the whole, the whole package. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, that back in the day. Um, and that's all good stuff. But it would be fun to talk over coffee or lunch about how well did the church train you for suffering well? You know what I mean? I'm just, I, I grew up with all that stuff, and I'm like, I don't remember a whole lot of skill set. Like, this, this, is, this is what you do. This is how you navigate suffering well. Um, I might have missed it, but anyway. So um, there's, there's a problem with that, and we're seeing that. And I'm not just blaming the church, um, because culture is, is, has a powerful force as well. We're all in a culture. So... Uh, millennials and younger people grow up in a culture that has you know, it's it's positive and encouraging and and not so um, not so keen on on embracing or learning or growing through suffering. Uh, you even see that in athletic stuff. If you follow sports, the 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 mindset of younger players and their ability to suffer and work hard, um, it's just different. And there was some were in the basketball thing. I don't follow basketball. I heard something on ESPN. I, it might have been UConn that said that coach. He expects and demands so much more suffering and, and effort than any other coach. Because other coaches, oh, you can't do that today. He's doing it. And he, it, it, it could, it, it, maybe it's not UConn, I don't know. But anyway, uh, the point is that our culture is different. And so uh, a lot of younger people, they kind of walk away from church. You know, they, they go through high school, they leave home, they go to college, and they get bombarded with a bunch of ideas, ridiculing their faith. They don't have answers. They don't have 
um, a way to respond. And then they walk away from faith. All right. It used to be that people thought that that was kind of temporary, and, and after then they get married. It's like, oh, wow, I'm an, I'm an adult. I'm married, and i got kids. I go, well, what do I do? I go to good church. And, and that, that happens sometimes, you know what I mean? And that's not all bad. I mean, any way we get here is good. But um, more and more, that trend is becoming non-reversible. People just leave and don't come back. Married kids, they don't come back. These are called the nuns, okay? Not N-U-N-S. N-O-N-E-S, nuns, because on these surveys of, you know, like, what's your religious background, this, that, other thing, they go to the one that says, none of the above. An entire segment of our population is increasingly identifying as none, just none. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. It, it's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so in 1972, 5% said there were nuns, no religion. 2018, 23%. By the 2030, it will be the largest religious group in our country. People who just say, I'm not connected in any way to anything religion-wise. All right? You probably know some nuns. N-O-N-E-S. Okay? You probably know some. So, again, um, the culture and the, and the, the, the millennials, the young people, it's not their fault. They didn't choose to, to do this. It's, it's the culture with our, the church and how everything's kind of packaged. They grow up in it. Everybody gets ribbon. A plus B equals C. You do this. You get that. And, and then as they grow and mature, they bump into reality, and, and everybody doesn't get a ribbon. I don't get promoted. And, and I did this, and I didn't get that. And, and, and all of a sudden, everything that they thought was supposed to work, it doesn't work. And they walk away. All right? not understanding the role of tension, suffering, disappointment as the normal working space for one who follows Jesus. I mean, Jesus' life wasn't exactly like smooth. Paul, not smooth, okay? I got a verse later about that. And so these young people grow up in, our, in the culture with the happy, positive, encouraging church. And, um, and I talked about moralistic theistic deism. It's just the, the, the way young people, they, they soak in these thoughts about God and religion. Five points. God exists, and he watches over human life from a distance. Um, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair. Uh, the goal of life is to be happy and feel good about yourself. God doesn't need to be involved in your life, except if you have a problem, then he can help you. Five, uh, good people go to heaven. This is where most young people just, just bounce through life. They kind of absorb that stuff. And then so if you need God and, oh, you have a crisis, well, you know, maybe you should check him out. But that's really all he's good for. And so then if life is increasingly difficult and, and um, hard, you, you're um, not going to get what you want. And so you easily walk away. All right? So... Uh, add that to the fact that we live in a post-Christian culture that says there's, there's no w one right way to think about anything. You just, you just make up your own stuff. So it's, it's, um, it's, this is how young people get inoculated to Christianity. You know what inoculation is? You get a little bit of a, of a, a, a virus or whatever, just enough so that your body overcomes and resists it. So a lot of people grow up, they're exposed to a little bit of Christianity and then they find it short, and they, they develop an immunity, and then they just walk away. All right? That's tragic. Um, expectations play a big role in that. You know, I, I, I went to church because I thought God would fix my marriage. I thought God would fix my addiction. I thought, I thought he was good. I thought he would want these things for me. And we're using him instead of knowing him. All right? So, um, some people are stuck in the suffering of Friday. They don't see hope. They, they don't see Sunday, all right? These are the people that uh, they, they thought these things. God didn't do what they wanted. They live in sadness and bitterness and anger and depression. And um, if they talk to God, it was just for a short season because he's obviously not listening. And so then they just stop talking. Uh, they, walk, they walk away because they didn't get what they wanted. It's kind of like uh, in Mark 10, uh, James and John, listen to this verse. Um, the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> Just like, that's out there, man. I mean, like, do you, do you understand what you're saying? I think they did. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying, but they knew what they wanted, okay? So, um, all right. So here's proof of, of our, our anti-suffering mindset. Let's just say that you're doing a deal with another believer 
uh, and you're selling a snowblower or whatever, uh, $1,400. They're just making up a thing. It's a very nice snowblower or lawnmower since now the snow's gone. And um, something, you know, you get it home and the thing's broken. It's full of sand or whatever. It's just like obviously you got ripped off. You go back and, and, and the, the, the believer's like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. It's your problem, it's your problem. And you're like, I have rights. This was wrong. I've been wronged. I'm going to sue this person. This is directly out of 1 Corinthians, except for the snowblower part. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 7. Um, to have lawsuits with another believer is already a defeat for you. He's like, guys, this isn't, this isn't how the body of Christ should work. Now listen to this advice and let it shock you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? We just, we don't go there quickly. I mean, that's not our first response. Oh, yeah, I got ripped off, and there's this person that teaches Sunday school. I'm just going to take the hit. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what? I mean, that, I, I have 14 movies in my head about how I can approach the, and none of them are this, all right? And, and yet Jesus, he didn't, he didn't die on the cross to help us not suffer. He died on the cross to show us how to suffer. Suffering is real. It's part of our, and, and, and don't be just a, a you know, a, the doormat and let people run you over. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, there, there are places for assertiveness, and there are, there are times to, to just pull back. So we'll have to walk in the Spirit on that one. But that, that's what I'm saying. I, I love this verse because it's so countercultural, and I'm intrigued by that. I'm, I, I don't pray about that much. You know what I mean? Like, like Lord, show me what this means because the things will happen. Uh, you get what I mean? So I'm, I'm just like, okay, um, I still want to investigate that with my, my heart and my attitude. Okay, so some people are all Friday people, no Sunday people, uh, no hope. Other people are all Sunday, and then no, no suffering. And the, they're, they're, they're very helpful. If you're suffering, they say it's your fault. Thank you for that. Well, all right, it's very, it's very odd. Oh, you're, you're, you're not praying enough. You did something wrong. Your great-grandpa did something wrong. I got a verse from Exodus on that one. You know what I mean? It's just weird, okay? And so um, it's not what that verse means. But anyway, so um, the disciples wanted the Sunday victory without the Friday suffering. Um, and we'll go through the whole thing. But their expectations were, you know, the Roman victory and be in charge and, and show the Pharisees and Sadducees and Romans we have power. Um, do for us whatever we ask. And it's not serving other people. <laughs> That's not what they were thinking. Um, after the resurrection, I just, I just can't, I can't believe this. After the resurrection, they meet the risen Jesus. He shows them the scars in his hands, and he says, this is how I fight. I don't fight like you fight. I'm not even fighting the same battle you're fighting. I'm fighting my own battle, and, and this is, you know, follow me. And they go fishing. They quit. They see the risen Jesus and they quit because they just want no part of suffering. That's not on their radar at all. They just, they go fishing, they go home, lock their doors, shut their doors in fear. Isn't that amazing? Wow. So suffering is part of life. And so the, the all Sunday, no Friday people um, you know, they try to put on the masks. They have to wear masks. I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for asking. Everything's fine. Isn't it wonderful? It's just what a great sermon. What a great hymn. It's just fine. The kids are fine in the masks and the lies. And we can't afford to be tra transparent because it's all Sunday. There, there's no suffering. It's all victory, rejoicing. And then they don't have the skill set to honestly live in a world of brokenness. And so the pretending, you can do that for a while, but then the burden and the, hypo, hypo, the, the hypocrisy just becomes unbearable. And you're like, I just forget it. I'm just going to quit. And that's what happens, all right? Which is why it's, it's important we understand when we come together here, I'm not perfect. I have issues, and, and you, and we're, we're not claiming that we're all buttoned up, and I don't wear a tie except a couple days a year, so don't, if you're visiting, you know, it's just, anyway. So we can be ourselves, and um, we receive forgiveness, we receive grace, we extend that, 
I appreciate you guys because I don't get complaints about the sound, the lighting, the layout, the, the music, or whatever. And so we just roll with stuff. Now, if you have con something constructive, like I, I can't hear you, or so, well, that's great, let us know. But we're not all a bunch of p picky people that are criticizing everything. You know what I mean? And I like that about this, about this body. So thank you for that. But um, if, we, if we skip Friday's suffering and we just go to Sunday's rejoicing, we're missing God's divine classroom of suffering. He teaches us a lot there. And we don't want to we don't want to skip the, we want to skip that but we shouldn't skip that, okay? Because that's what he that's what he wants. The way of Jesus is the way of the cross, all right? Um, the, the Jesus of majesty is also the Jesus of mockery. He was mocked. They they, they go together, all right? Um, the way of the cross is not one of self-fulfillment, progress, fulfillment, wealth, and health. And there are some YouTube channels that say different, all right? So be careful. Um, we know we don't understand the way of Jesus when we are surprised by suffering. So I want to challenge you with suffering and just like when it comes, we, we, will, we will need your surprise and we'll go through a couple negative things and then, and then we'll pull back and go, wait a minute, Lord, are, do you have a hand in this? Do, can you have a hand in this? What might be your purposes? What can you do in this mess? Okay, and he can do something, all right? Suffering is super common in Scripture. A third of all the Psalms are suffering-related. Lamentations, one entire book, heavy-duty suffering, all right? Paul suffered, um, you know, he, um, five times he was whipped, three times beaten with rods, once he was stoned, shipwrecked. He has a drift in the sea for a whole night and day. These are good stories. This would be a good movie. It'd be rated R, but it'd be a good movie for violence, right? Um, he goes on and on and on. So, suffering is the way of Jesus. It's the way uh, that, that God works in a fallen world. And here's the cool part. It, we don't just like endure it. It's purposeful. He can redeem suffering, even overt evil. He can spin it and redeem it and do his work through it. Well, that's a, we can't lose, right? It's, it's painful, but it's amazing. He's never out of the ability to, to uh, work his grace, all right? Um, but having said that, when did Noah build the ark? Before the rain. And I keep, I keep inviting us to build your theology of suffering before the rain. And you maybe won't ever get it built, but what I mean is start thinking about what does suffering mean? Does it mean God is mean and angry, out of control? No, it doesn't do that. It feels like that, it feels like that. When Don and I were dating, we had to break up for a while for various reasons, and I was, it was just torn up. And I remember I walked out of the dorm, I looked at the sky, and I said to myself, well, Lord, the stars are still hanging in the sky. I guess you're still in control. It just doesn't feel like it. You know, and so that's the reality. I, you know, I'm, I, I, I hear and I read and I see evidence that God is good and in control and powerful, but my experience for a season is it, it feels different. So we, we need to realize that's, that's part of reality. We got married and it worked out, but I'm just saying. All right. Um, here's a quote I read. If you cannot talk with God from a platform of suffering, you're missing a huge aspect of real life with God. If you can't talk to God from a platform of suffering, you're missing out. Okay? Sometimes we're, we're ashamed and, and we're like, oh, you know, God's upset with me. I can't, I can't talk to him. Have you read Psalms? Half the Psalms, David's yelling at God about how unfair something is. How come this? How come that? And that's, that's the real experience, okay? Um, all right. So, Jesus went straight to the cross on purpose. He's not a victim. And his whole life, he, he leveraged all the aspects of his existence to get to the cross, Okay? Um, the disciples, they never really clued in, but he was moving to the cross with the disciples. All the people in the villages, um, the people in the synagogue, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these people, Jesus just navigating, I'm going to the cross. He tells them in Mark three times, I'm going to go to the cross, this is going to happen, and third day, and whew, right? Um, to get to the cross, and so Jesus was not surprised when he ends up on the cross. Why are we? 
Isn't that interesting? Our culture, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very amazing world we live in with all kinds of conveniences and comforts that can kind of skew our view of suffering. We, we're like, like a fish out of water, kind of like, I, I don't know how to, what to do. I'm going to help you out with some practical stuff, okay? So here's, here's where we go. Are you a weekend Christian? You should be, because Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we wouldn't have to. There's like a little bit of truth on that, but really my point is like, he went to the cross to show us how to. He says, take up your cross and follow me. He shows us his nail-pierced hands. This is where I'm taking you. And yeah, I think I might want to go fishing, right? Because it's, it's not real attractive. Like, Jesus, do you have a PR consultant? Because we need to work on your present. You get what I'm saying? It's just, it's just harsh and, 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 and very different from our culture, okay? So that's kind of where we're going um, how to connect. I want to I want to teach you something that's been very helpful to me about how to get there, okay? How to both identify the Friday Friday suffering and the Sunday rejoicing. And um, and this is uh, this is coming from a book I read and it's it's biblical, but it's just all about identifying with Jesus at the moment of suffering, so we identify with the, the, the power of his resurrection power, okay? Um, and so it's called the J-curve. It's just the idea is that Jesus died and he rose from the dead. And this process, he willingly did this. He didn't, he didn't blame God. He suffered well. No one really understood what he was doing. But then he rose, he rose from the dead. And so the idea is that as we experience suffering of any kind, that is an invitation to think we can identify with the suffering that Jesus had. Uh, family dysfunction and family problems are super common. Everybody has some degree of family trauma and, and dysfunction, sin and, and ripple effects. Jesus did. His own family rejected him, thought he was crazy. Multiple verses. In fact, one of them, one of his brothers says, look, if you want to be a big deal, j- just go to Galilee and do your stuff there. They just, they didn't. So if you have family pain, you can, Jesus can identify with that, all right? And you can just like, Lord, th- this is not unique to me. He walked through that, and then we can experience um, a, a, a resurrection. I'm not just talking about from the dead. I'm talking about resurrection of hope, uh, of our spirit, maybe of that relationship in the future. And so this is, this is our system, right? We die, maybe I die to the dream of the perfect family or health or financially, whatever it is. We all have multiple deaths. And when we experience those, we reach out in our mind like, Lord, you either experience this one for one, like family stuff, or you know what, what I'm going through, okay? And then uh, we rise with Christ in hope, and we see the power of his resurrection in our attitude, our spiritual growth. And honestly, this is, the, this is very helpful. Because in the moment, this is a tactic. This is a skill that I can do that helps me trust in him and not manipulate, leverage, panic, blame, shame, all that whole other stuff, which is pretty easy. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I can just quiet my heart and go, okay, the, the, my number one goal here is not to end suffering. Or, or, or it's to identify with Christ, receive his comfort in the middle of suffering. Now, aren't you interested in being in the middle of suffering and having peace? That surpasses understanding. And there's a verse in Peter about how that is a great testimony, okay? So what I'm, I, I love the, just the picture of that. It's like, okay, Lord, this happened. I, I, I didn't, you suffered. You suffered well. You suffered on purpose. It was restorative, redemptive, and I just look to you in this situation. Give me endurance. Give me patience to see what your work is here, and that, that actually transforms us. We're no longer fear, fearfully trying to avoid suffering. We don't make it up for ourselves, but, but we can look at the suffering as an invitation to identify and draw closer to Jesus, and that is powerful, all right? Um, in fact, that whole idea of identifying with Jesus and suffering well dominates Paul's thinking. I mean, in Romans and Galatians, he talks about justification by faith, but listen to all these books where he talks about identifying with Jesus in a suffering. Philippians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Romans 6, Romans 8, Colossians 1 and 3, Ephesians 1, Philemon, 1 Thessalonians, and Acts, all over the place. It's a dominant theme. When we suffer, we identify with Christ, and we move on. Let me read you this verse from Philippians 3, and you'll, you'll hear it. 
Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss, the death, of all things that count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, that's the resurrection part, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share his sufferings, identification, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I can attain the resurrection from the dead. He's looking forward to the resurrection of the dead. He's not wondering if he's saved. So, so that's Paul's mindset. It's super common in, in Scripture, and that's what um, I think Easter is a good time to look at that, um, that process. All right, so we identify with Jesus' sufferings. We, that actually gives us hope. There's purpose in the suffering. We don't blame others. We can find peace with ourselves. Sometimes we're the hardest on ourselves, right? We can find peace with ourselves with, with this process of identifying with Jesus. So, don't be, a, don't be surprised by suffering. It's an invitation to identify with Jesus and receive his comfort, commune with him. We may be confused, but we stay connected to God, right? We, we learned that in Job. Job is confused, confused, but he's connected, and so that's, that's kind of our model. We want to do that. We grow in intimacy when we identify with Jesus. We grow in peace, and we have a God that understands suffering. Last verse, Hebrews 4, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. In the middle of your sin, in the middle of your addiction, in the middle of your worst day, this truth reaches out with kindness and God is like, I understand. It's a brutally wicked, hard world. Been there. Look what happened to me. Okay, he can relate, and then we draw close to him, we receive forgiveness. So, Jesus didn't go to the cross, so you wouldn't have to. He went to the cross, he says, so he showed us how to take up our cross and follow him. So, um, usually we close here. If you've never been with us, we have a couple key questions. I'd like to close out just thinking, we'll have some quiet music here, and we just think and pray, like, Lord, what do you have for me? Um, are you a weekend Christian in, in, in the good way that I'm portraying it, Friday suffering and Sundays? Do you embrace both suffering and resurrection? Are you open to identifying with the suffering Jesus the next time you suffer? Again, an invitation to what he might have in that situation instead of um, freaking out, shaming, and blaming. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for the power of the resurrection. Thank you that it, it mattered th a couple thousand years ago. But thank you that it matters today in our relationships, what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Uh, you are constantly redeeming us from the effects of sin in so many ways. We are glad that you can do that, that you can redeem suffering. Um, our culture is not keen on that. You know, everything's about positive encouraging and wealth and health. And would you just give us insight into our own motives and attitudes and help us just be still and identify with your suffering and receive comfort from you and, and draw close to you in the middle of that. And, and we just pray that that process would yield fruit of some kind that only you can do. Amen.